Good afternoon and welcome to Robbing Minds. My name is Isabella Adediji. Now, it's been one year since the new administration, not so new anymore, under President Bola Ahmed Tinubu came into office. And there's so many bold and audacious moves that this government has made um, right from the moment this government was sworn in. We all remember last year when it was announced that um, the subsidy has been removed on petroleum products. We also remember the audacious move to float the Naira. And we've seen some of the effects with um, inflation. We've seen cost of living increase. We've also seen um, the introduction of the student loan. And then most recently, um, we're now going back to the old anthem, which is now the new anthem, Nigeria, we hail thee. Um, one year has passed. Um, is it too early to start asking those questions, to start holding this government accountable on the manifesto promises? Um, some Nigerians have even gone as far as saying, well, they prefer the previous administration. Or do we still need to give this administration time to prove itself? Um, how do we go forward from here one year into office? And to discuss this and to look back at some of the key moments of this administration in the past one year, I have with me in the studio a policy research and development expert in the person of Israel Fawale. Welcome to Robin Mind. Oh, thank you so much, Tabela. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you for honoring our invitation. We yeah, also have joining us virtually via Zoom, Tochuku Simon, who is a media personality. Hello, Tochuku. Um, hello, Isabel. Hi, how are you? I'm good afternoon. Good. Good afternoon. Good to have you. So I'll start with you, Israel. Um, let's look at the past one year. Um, is it too soon to start holding this government accountable to those electoral promises? Um, do Nigerians need to exercise a bit more patience to see some of these um, bold and audacious moves yield the returns and dividends that have been promised? Um, dividends of a renewed hope. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Um just like you have rightly said, it is um, not too soon. If we have um, given a president a chance, this is 365 days counting, and uh, we are not seeing you know, evidence of, uh, we're not seeing beautiful outcomes of the democratic processes, it is high time we start asking questions. And you, you rightly mentioned about the audacious move of the removal of um, first subsidy. I mean, it is no news, it is one of the fundamental uh, moves of the Mr. President, and it's quite wrong. I mean, well, we understand the fact that the president has very ambitious you know, economic reforms, but you know there are processes when it comes to you know, implementing policies. You know, back then, Daniel and Sabins, for example, gave us an ethical framework when it comes to policy implementation. We call it um, A for R, accountability for reasonableness. And it gives us some four conditions, critical conditions, that when you want to make a policy, these are some of the things you, know, you should look at. It talked about uh, the relevance. Yeah, what are the concerns? What are the evidences? What are the reasons why you want to make this decision? It's very, very important. You also want to check the, the what do you call it? You want to look at the publicity, how, how public, what is, the, um, what is the perception of the public? Because sometimes you think, oh, as government, oh, it is very important to give these people water. But truly, truly, have you asked them what they truly want, how they want to be led? So it's very important that, you know, people you are leading, you carry them along, you ask them questions, not to just come in with some, very beautifully designed, you know, policies, and you think, you know, imposing them on, you know, the populace, and you are, that is not, the, you know, that is not the right, you know, right thing. So sometimes I, you know, it's very good that, you know, as a leader or as government, it's very good that they, they, you first calm down, engage the people, get feedbacks, you know, and, and that's why, you know, in the process of policy making, there's something we call it assessment. Have you really gone around to, uh, to gather together data to help you make informed decisions about the need of the people? And that is one of the first things that I feel Mr. President should have done. So that consulting the people before announcing some of these huge reforms that have a um, lasting impact. I'd like to move to you, Tochuko, and I'm posing the same question. Is it too soon to start demanding for the fulfillment of those electoral promises? And in your own view, um, following up on what um, Israel said, um, 
Were Nigerians consulted? Was there enough consultation before some of these bold and audacious moves were made by the president and his administration? Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Isabella. Uh, first of all, there's a saying, uh, I'm Igbo, so there's a saying where I come from, that it's from the daytime that you can predict how the rest of the day will be. From morning, that's how you predict how the rest of the day will be. Uh, and so far, judging this administration, the morning has been uh, very disastrous. Uh, there's been no tangible improvement. There's been nothing to write home about. Um, you know, Buhari's administration set the bar very, very low. So uh, this administration just had to come in and just make small, small changes to sort of like uh, improve the lives of Nigerians, but nothing has been done so far. And so this first year, um, it's just, I just want to tell Nigerians to brace up uh, because uh, it's not looking good. Uh, and speak from uh, what Israel said, it is very true. During uh, uh, Bola Metinubu's inauguration, he announced uh, quite abruptly that so uh, subsidy was gone. And, you know, this is not how you make certain policies that have such a huge impact on uh, the lives of millions and millions of Nigerians. You don't just announce it. But what you do is cause a lot of panic. Uh, and that's exactly what happened because we saw and we are still seeing the impact of, you know, fuel scarcity, the fuel queues, uh, the prices have gone all over the roof. You know, uh, people are buying for 600, 700, 900. I'm currently in the East. We're buying from 800 to 840. So it's, you don't just announce a policy like that without you know, setting a framework for how this is going to impact on the people. Um, and we see that in a, a, a certain policies as well. With the anthem change, there was no consultation with the people. Do we need a new national anthem or an old national anthem at this point? Uh, we don't see that. We don't see that connection with the people, with uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu's administration. And that is very worrisome. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move back to you, Israel. And um, in defense of the administration, they say the removal of subsidy allows for investments to come in and that money that has been um, budgeted in the past for subsidy can be diverted to infrastructural development. Now, we know that building infrastructure takes time. So do you also agree that um, Nigerians should brace up? Are you hopeful that these um, the promised infrastructure will manifest? And is it worth the um, sacrifice that Nigerians have had to make in this past one year. Okay, so I'm going to use the Abraham Maslow hierarchy of need, for example, to you know, paint a portrait of a scenario. The most basic is shelter, food, yeah, and all of those things. So you don't have a shelter, you are buying assorted suits, like all these uh, very expensive suits. I mean, after wearing the suit, where are you going to sleep? So these are basic things. So we are not saying that infrastructural development is not good, but we are saying that before you talk about infrastructural development, people must at least, at least be able to live comfortably. It is who is alive would, that, is, that will enjoy the infrastructural development. And what is the point when you know, there is serious, you know, significant economic hardship in the land? People have gone into crime. There has been a lot of you know, moral, you know, moral breakdown, you know, moral decadence, and you are not building infrastructure. The money you will spend you know, meditating the effect of moral decadence is even going to be much more because simple protest, people are going to destroy you know, some of these things. We are not encouraging violence during protest, but we are saying that if people are not comfortable, if people cannot, you know, the earning power of people is low, and there is serious, you know, spending power. How are people going to survive? So we are not saying infrastructure is, is, no, is, is, is bad. It's very good to have such ambition. But we are saying that people should at least be able to, you know, live comfortably. And that is what we are saying. And that is why we are saying that, yes, first subsidy remover, you know, shows that, yeah, the, the president have, you know, very beautiful economic ambition, economic reforms ambition for the, it is very beautiful one. But we are saying before such decisions are made, before such policies are implemented, things should be, you know, in place. So it's a very good, yes, we work, it is a welcome idea, infrastructural development, but basic need of the people must be need. Life must be made easier for the common man. People, they are, you know, when you want to look at the Abraham Maslow hierarchy, there are people who live, majority of Nigerians live below, at the base, you know, of the pyramid, when all they want to even do in life is just to survive. Just and to that have, survivor means afford meals and just have a roof over just there. Just have, have a roof to live. Um, to live. I, I'll move to you, Tochuku. And again, with these um, abrupt, as um, 
Israel has said, these moves without enough consultation. Um, what do you feel the government should be doing in addressing um, the cushions that need to be there, whether it's palliatives or whether it is as simple as increasing the minimum wage? If we've seen inflation at an all-time high and the prices of food, shelter, the basic amenities have doubled and even tripled, what should the government be doing now? Um. I'm, I'm going to divest, I'm going to change the question a little bit from what the government should be doing um, to what they are not doing. Um, now is not the best time to be spending 90 billion on Hajj. We have very serious and dire um, economic challenges, and the government is not even, you know, interested in solving those issues. You know, we speak of palliatives. We shouldn't have to be. We shouldn't have to be constantly giving palliatives because where is that money coming from? We can't be taking loans so that we can spend it on palliatives. Do you understand? Take, invest in human capital development. Invest in education. Invest in health. There were there was a time where people expatriates used to come to Nigerian hospitals, spend foreign currency to get healthcare in Nigeria. If you invest in those critical areas that improve the capacity and the earning, the purchasing power of your people, then we can absorb the, the effect of the fuel subsidy. You can't be paying somebody 30,000 naira a month and selling fuel to them for 60, 600 naira, 800 naira a litre and then give them a rice and indomie as palliatives. It doesn't make any sense. It's, 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 it's just very absurd. I don't know if you understand what I mean. When you put... Uh, uh, things in place so that people can earn, improve the uh, increase the uh, employment rate. You understand? Reduce the taxes. People are poor, and, and you are taxing them on top of poverty, and you're not increasing what they're earning. So make that make sense. So these are things that the government needs to do. Forget palliatives. We have so much money. And we're spending it on the wrong things. We can't be spending trillions on a road that nobody needs, that nobody asks for. We can't be spending almost a hundred billion to finance a, a, a religious pilgrimage when we have people living in poverty. So the priorities of the government are not even right. And I don't think they, that the people that are making the decisions uh, that, that, that affect over 200 million people even have their heads in the right place. So you, you might as well sit down all day and give advice and say this is what, what and what they should do. They don't have any intentions of getting this right. So, so, so you know, it's just very... The it's question very, is very, about very, government prioritizing things like education, like healthcare, um, prioritizing um, the, the minimum wage to ensure that the common man, the, the man that and woman that um, live on so little can afford the basics to move themselves from one place to the other to earn a decent wage. Now, I'd like to move to you, Israel. And in terms of prioritization in, in policy, w w how do you rate this administration in the past one year? Have they um, prioritized things that benefit the entire populace? Or like Tochuku said, um, is the priority in the wrong place looking at um, pilgrimage, for example? And I know that this government has come out to say they are cutting down the cost of governance by limiting foreign trips. Is that enough? Oh, okay. So um, there are quite a number of opinions I have about that, I'm just going to say. But I would, if, if Mr. President have done something right that I feel I should really comment, is recent uh, consultative between with Arewa Elders Forum where you call on governors to give the local governments the autonomy that they deserve, because that is the hope of common man. I mean, in Nigeria, we have 8,806 8, you know, words, and these are the words that mix for local governments. And he talked about how that you know, development is actually a local thing. And of course, you have no business in, you know, the, you have no business in governance or political arena, if what you're thinking is not development. And if you're thinking development, you're thinking that it must start from the world. This, Location, for example, is in the world. Development of each world lies on the local government, you know, administration. So, you know, if there is something that I know that the government has, you know, the president has, you know, 
done well or, or shown intention of doing is about calling the, gov the governors to give that autonomy to what you call it, the local government authority. So that is fine. We hope that will not just stop as a mere press you know, conversation. We hope it will take necessary political steps to implement that. Of course, uh, judging about, talking about the, um, what do you call the policies, uh, the um, 90 billion allocation for uh, for pilgrimage, is it subsidy or something is a very wrong one when people cannot eat, when people cannot afford to pay tuition. I mean, many private, I'm sorry, many public schools, even federal government schools are increasing tuition fee. Yet we have 190 billion somewhere that cannot be pumped into education and that has been given to pilgrimage people. This is a voluntary thing. If you want to go there, if you can't afford it, you should go on your own. So that is not a very good one. Also, policies that I feel the government should have done better. Of course, we're talking about, AK, I mean, Tochuku mentioned about, you know, government should involve in ESCO. Of course, a LD nation, when you want to look, talk about one of the uh, indices to rate, you know, uh, a government is about, is about their investment in health. Of, of late, we, we heard about the uh, NMCN guide from the federal government that nurses should not travel. When we have a lot of nurses in Nigeria who are not even employed, how much are nurses you know, being paid you know, even in the country? So these are issues. We should look into it, this issue rather than placing priorities of policies on things, on, on chasing shadows and leaving the main you know, issues. If Nigeria is, is habitable enough, no, no nurse, no right thinking person would think of you know, traveling outside the country. So why not think about policies that can encourage you know, people to stay back why, you know, you should look at why are they running away? So increase... That's a very important point that you bring up and it ties into what Tochuku said about human capital development. development right. and, and my question is, um, the human capital to be developed was seen massive brain drain. We're seeing um, Nigerians living in droves to other countries to seek greener pastures. Um, how do we now invest in this human capital when the human capital is departing the shores and what has been the effect in the past one year of this brain drain to the economy to the people tochuku tochuku are you there tochuku okay i believe there might be um, a problem with the sound We'll get back to you, Tochuko. Um, I'll move to you, Israel, and that point about the human capital development, development. and the brain drain. Um, we're seeing the effect. What does the government even need to do to the ex existing capital, and what has been the effect of that uh, flight of talent? Okay, so what I can say, one of the things I would say is that the brain drain can be turned into brain gain if the government is going to really invest in right policies let the government fund education properly, let the government fund the, let, the, let there be policies to reform the healthcare sector, address issues of medical imperialism within the sector, you know, look side for government appointment within the sector, carry all stakeholders. When you talk about the healthcare sector, you talk about the nursing, you talk about the you know, lab scientists, you talk about you know, the radio people, you know, bring everybody to the round table, give everybody an equal grant to contribute you know, to policy making processes. Do you involve these people when you are making policies? I mean, we've seen the National Association of Nigerian Nurses coming out to say, oh no, they stand against this. That means they were not even carried along before that, policies, you know, that policy was made. So people, stakeholder, relevant stakeholders need to be carried along. So it goes back to that point on engaging the, the, people, the people before yes. going about um, making some of these um, decisions that have very huge impact yeah, on and everyone to, and to, else. To, Sorry, to, to, I wanted to see if we can get um, Tochuku. Okay. Um, Tochuku, are you still there? Tochuku. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask, Can you hear me? I'd like, I'd, yes, uh, good to have you back. I'd like to know um, how you rate this government on security because we know that in the eastern parts we're still hearing of the Monday sit at home. Um, and just like Israel has said that um, this government is engaging with, say, the governors. Um, how do you rate this government and even down to the governors in ensuring that um, we have peace? Um, people are safe to move about from place to place? Um, it's unfortunate that uh, I was just checking uh, the Global Terrorism Index, and Nigeria is currently number eight uh, on the list of most terrorized countries in the world. Um, and security is a very, very key um, part of building our economy, because without Without security, 
the, the food inflation that we're seeing now and food insecurity that we're seeing now is as a result of insecurity. Farmers can't go to their farms anymore. So, um, so far, we're not seeing any significant improvement um, in security. Um, we're still seeing uh, a daily news coming out from Plateau, from Abia State, just over the, the, the last week. Uh, people can move about on Mondays. I'm currently in the east. I had to. Uh, I came to visit my my family, and uh, last week I was. I wanted to go out on Monday, and my my parents said, "Don't go anywhere." I was, I was like, you, "You people still do this?" So there's really no um, serious effort to curb insecurity. You know, there's no. Well, the, the president is supposed to be the commander in chief, and we're not seeing that sort of you know commanding or leadership leading from the front. You know, we've not seen the president even going to empathize with places where, you know, bandits or terrorists have struck. We're not seeing any attempts to beef up security. What we're seeing is sort of a um, reactive approach instead of a proactive approach to fighting insecurity. Um, and, you know, that's that's just not how to deal with this issue. We have to fight, you know, these... Um, uh, uh, All right. Out to of factors and yet... Yes, the, the government needs Hello. to do more. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you um, for that more. contribution. Um, just before we go out of time, um, I just want to get your views, Israel, on the big one, corruption. Um, every government comes promising to address corruption at the roots to ensure that almost that big elephant in the room is eradicated. How would you rate in a minute or less um, this government in the past one okay. year. Oh, to be very honest, I think Mr. President and this administration have really tried on the issue of corruption. We have seen the EFCC chairman, you know, standing and, you know, facing the giants to say, oh, no, I'm going to bring you to, you know, uh, to justice. Whether you like it or not, run away, we would look after you. So I think they have uh, so far so good been transparent in their approach to fighting corruption. I think I would give that to them. They have tried uh, their, their best. So far, so good. Okay. And, and very quickly, I think we still have about 30 seconds or so. Um, Tochuku, if you can just weigh in on corruption, and that will be um, the final contribution. Um, the better I do, better I do um, has not been tried. Uh, billions have been allocated for uh, road constructions. No transparency in contract uh, award and approvals. So I would rate this administration very low on fighting corruption. I have very little expectations for them in that regard, really. Very little um, in that regard. Thank you, Tochuku, uh, media personality who has joined us on Zoom for your contributions. And um, thank you, uh, policy research and development expert um, Fawale Israel for your contributions Thank you so much. on Robin Minds. How would you rate this administration in the past 3, 600, 365 days, in the past one year? How has this government fared in delivering those electoral promises, promising a renewed hope on security, on the economy, on healthcare, on education? Um, a lot of questions are out there. Nigerians want answers. Um, of course, you can always join our conversation online. Um, we still have two more segments coming up, so don't go anywhere. We're going on a quick break, and when we come back, we'll continue the show. Stay with us. Gone are the days when a girl, a woman, is only to be seen and um, only to be heard and not seen. Gone are the days where the woman is reserved to certain rooms and their functions um, go beyond just child rearing and homemaking. Um, we've gone past that. And it's so important that the girls we're raising see women achieve their potential before women didn't go to school, before women didn't campaign, they didn't end up on the ballot sheet, but a lot has changed. And I think it's so important that these girls begin to see role models that they can inspire to, um, role models that inspire them to be all that they can be. And that's why it was so important for the AW Network to host schoolgirls to watch the Fumilayo Ransom Kuti biopic, which was directed and produced by the award-winning Bolanle Austin Peters.
my Kutu was a determined woman, a lioness, a courageous woman, very nice and kind. Like, she's not my new role model. I love her so much. If we see people that have done stuff, then it breaks the barriers of our minds, right? If you use, like, uh, runners, like, before who say Bolt, you know, you know, broke the record, people thought that there was only such a limit that you could reach, right? And then people have gone after that to, to try, right? Because they know it's possible. And so when you see women doing, rising to the top of their careers, doing, you know, amazing things, being amazing people, mothers, um, then it, it tells you that you can't, there's nothing you can't do, right? It just gives you permission to be great. What I also learned is that we should always be courageous, we should have a kind character, and we should learn how to stand up for ourselves. She always come out and be bold in everything we do, and we should always come as fighters, and we should do things to consider the opinion of others. I just watched from Lyra and some Kuti. The movie is really nice and all. You must be bold, courageous, chase your dreams. So, it's just a way to like reach out to all ladies, all women out there, all girls, that we should like chase our dreams, we should always be bold, we should go at it. We, I really wish to be someone like her one day, very soon. Happy Girls, I am one! Do you enjoy the film? Yes! Do you want to see things from here? Yes! I'm sure you learned, the most important thing that you must have learned is that it's possible as a girl child to do so much with your life, right? Yeah. That was really heartwarming, seeing those girls speak about courage, about following their dreams, about being inspired. And I'm glad that um, no one said, oh, Fumilaya Ransom Kuti was the first woman to drive a car because there's so much to that story, to that potential of the female child, as we have seen in women before us, like Fumilaya Ransom Kuti. Now, moving to our actor, a child actor today. You've probably seen her in the movie Obaram. You've seen her in the Africa Magic series Covenant, as well as other productions. Uh, it's such a delight to have Dara Simi Nadi on the show. Welcome to Robin Minds. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you for honoring our invitation. Now, <laughs> I'm really curious because I look at you and I wish um, I look back at my um, earlier years and I know it was a dream to be an actor or an actress and somehow that didn't work till maybe much later. So what was the journey like? Um, I'm sure you nursed the same dream as I did, but somehow you're able to make it a reality. Take us down that um, lane. Um, my journey to acting wasn't really smooth because my mom was against it. Mm. She didn't want me to be an actor because she didn't like the fact that many producers wanted their children to be actors. Mm. So she didn't want me to be an actor, but I wanted to be an actor. I and love that. To I... me, what I want is what matters. So it took... So how months. did you convince your mom? It took months to convince her. Every single time we're watching a movie and I see a child act, I'll be like, I can do better. Then I'll take the line out, I'll be like, D -d 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 Mommy, can't you see? I can do better. My mom still didn't believe me until one day her friend came and it was her friend who saw that I could act. And then the rest is history. Oh, wow. So you, you didn't give up. You mm. made sure that Definitely you showed not. your potential. I love that. Um, not just watching and saying, well, I can do it, but actually showing that um, you can do it. Uh, 
like who inspired this love for acting? Do you have um, actors locally or um, internationally that well, encouraged, inspired, motivated you to keep at it? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> I just felt like I was meant for the camera because my mom's a producer, like I said before, and she's done a couple movies and I've seen it before. And I just felt like, that's me, I'm supposed to be here. I was supposed to do this. So there was like, there was nobody who inspired me. I inspired myself to do it. So, yeah. Okay. Would you say in any way your mom being a producer might have opened your eyes to some of the opportunities or was it just watching other child actors and thinking, well, I can do that and I can do better? It was just watching other children and saying, I can do better. Like, oh, who's this? I can do better. So everyone keeps thinking my mom was the one who pushed me, but I pushed myself. Like it's, in, it's interesting to know that a producer who knows the potential of um, raising a child actor who can grow on to have um, an illustrious career as an adult was even the one who had the fears and the doubts about it. Um, okay, now I'm, I'm looking at um, schoolwork because I think that's the main thing that how do you balance schoolwork? How do you balance, do, do you act in school? How do you balance those commitments? Yes, I act in school sometimes and sometimes I direct plays and pantomimes for my school and I have lesson teachers when I'm available they come over to my house and then we do lessons and then I have online lesson teachers yeah so that's how I balance and when I'm in school I pay full attention so do you do you have to miss school on some days or you just yeah. okay like when I was doing Obara I missed my exams wow. so I had to come back and do it that, that means you must have had to um, convince the school authorities. Um, no. And they were okay with They're you. They're just fine with it. As long as I come back, write my exams and perform work, they're fine with it. Do you then feel under pressure, like having to learn lines, but also having to remember stuff you studied in school? No. So um, my, I teach myself to act. So I don't need to cram the lines. I read the script, understand it, become the character. And when I get on set to shoot that particular scene, I read the lines so I don't have to learn it. So I don't feel under pressure. And when I'm free, I read. So yeah, I don't feel under pressure at all. And yeah, basically. So, so tell me, like, let's go back in time to mm -hmm. the first opportunity you had, whether it was a movie or a series. Um, did you have any sort of fears, any apprehension? It was just all excitement. Um, walk me through that. Okay, the first movie was, the title of the movie is Unforgotten, I think. I, I'm not sure. And I did it with Ms. Bolaji and some other actors so yes it was basically excitement and i wasn't perfect no one is perfect so when i got on set i was <clears throat> i was smiling and taking my lines because i was a beginner <laughs> yes i mean i was a beginner so i was smiling and taking my lines but everyone could see that i can do better than that mm. so basically yeah so, so how did the director work with you to improve your courage, your, um, to improve your craft? Okay, so um, he gave me tips before I went on set. He's like, okay, for this scene, you're supposed to cry. So even if you can't bring out tears, just, like, just make it look like you're crying. And then I'm like... <laughs> so he just kept pushing and he didn't want to stop because he saw that this little girl has potential. We should push her. And, and, really and how that. old were you when that happened? I was eight. Eight. Mm -hmm. So you've been acting for how many years now? Four years. Wow, four years. What has been the biggest lesson in those four years? I'm a work in progress. Mm. I am never going to be perfect. The best thing I can do is be my best. And I cannot go off my limits to do something like to push to be perfect because I can't be perfect. Like when I was eight, I told someone, a guest on my show that you can't be a perfectionist. It's not right. Just do your best. 
I always knew that I can't be perfect. So I am a work in progress. And I feel like everyone else is a work in progress. So no one can be perfect. That's, that's just it. A work in progress. So have you now done anything to improve yourself? Maybe watch um, yeah. videos on YouTube mm -hmm. or sign up for acting classes? Mm -hmm. So I did um, Kids Can Act with Mr. Stan Inze. Okay. And I learned a lot of things that I am sure I will never forget and it really helped a lot with my career because every single time I read a script I just remember all those things and yes sometimes I watch a few stuff on YouTube so that I could like understand the character better like when I was playing an autistic um, character I had to go to YouTube and understand everything I needed to know about being an autistic child so yes I go to YouTube sometimes, and I signed up for an acting class once. Okay. Well, it's, it's good to see that you're um, taking proactive steps to improve your craft. Now, I, I'm curious to know, have you now decided to work with mom? Um, have you starred in any of her productions? Any particular reason why? <laughs> My mommy doesn't want to. <laughs> Still now, she still does what you... No, she's... Since I convinced my mom that I could act, she's my number one fan. Mm. But the thing is, she does her movies outside of Lagos. Mm. And when she does it, I'm in school. So she doesn't want to pull me out because of her own movie. Ah, that's the mother in her that is thinking like, OK, yeah. let, let's balance it. Let's yeah. ha maybe if it happens during the holidays. Maybe. Yes, then you can follow me. But like now, sit down, ah. sit down there. Does it pay well as a child actor? Do you get control of your money or does mom take everything and use it for your school fees? Nope. It doesn't pay well. It, it pays well. Oh, it actually. does. Okay. My mom doesn't keep all my money. I have allowances. Okay. And my mom always teaches me to save my money. Mm. Like she's going to keep that book with herself. But if I need it, She's going to give me little out of it. Not the entire money I need. Because you got your monthly allowance, so add it to the one that you need. So basically, my mom doesn't take everything and keep it to herself. My mom's not greedy. Oh, so, so as you're making all this money, which you say is good money as a <laughs> child actor, you're not allowed to start flexing, buy the latest nah. clothes, shoes, mm -hmm. and show that you're a movie star. No. Okay. <laughs> What's what, the use? What are you saving it for? Well... I'm saving it to buy my phone when I'm 14. Okay. <laughs> that, that's a good one. I, uh, this, the phone will probably cost a pretty penny if you're saving it mm -hmm. uh, till then. Okay. Uh, what are the perks of being an actress? Um, do, you, do you go to places and they're asking for the, um, your autograph or yes. they're giving two pieces of meat instead of one? <laughs> okay. Um, yes. I get... Um, I'm given an advantage when, like, that's when people know it's there to see me. Sometimes I go on set and nobody knows who I am. No matter how popular you are, there's that one person who doesn't know who you are. Like one of my classmates, she only found out four weeks ago who Barack Obama was. Wow. So no matter how popular you are, there's that one person who wouldn't know you. And yes, everyone... The people who know Dara Simi want to take pictures with Dara Simi, want to show their children or their friends that they were with Dara Simi. And I actually love it. Ah, so I you like have it. lots of fans. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, how, how do your friends um, cope with the fame? Like, do people want to be your friends just yeah. because they see you on TV? Yeah. So how do you know who is really your friend and who just wants... Darcy, me the actor. Okay, so when you come to meet me for the first time, I strike a conversation with you. And if you cannot strike a personal, not so personal conversation, then I know that you're not meant to be my friend. If you keep talking, oh yeah, how do you, how do you um, act? How are you on TV, da da da? And we're out of time, but my final question mm -hmm. is, um, what advice do you have for child actors watching you okay. wanting to be just like you? Be yourself and always find a way to be in the spotlight because you're meant to be in the spotlight. Everyone's meant to be in the spotlight. Whatever you can do, just be there, okay? 
thank you very much, Dara Sivi Nadi, for being our guest on Robbie Minds. Thank and all you. the best with your future productions and school. Thank you, ma'am. We'll take a quick break here on Robbie Minds. Don't go anywhere. Don't just stand there teasing me. Now it's time to show up. What is it like raising children in a generation of artificial intelligence? In a generation where everything is literally at the tip of your fingers. A generation where devices are readily available, information, lots of information is at the fingertips of these children. And there's the pressure of social media, of acceptance, not just to their immediate peers, but to a wider community and indeed a global village. Um, in a time when gentle parenting is being promoted, in a time when we're having conversations around diversity, you will agree that raising children is a different kettle of fish in today's world. To discuss raising kids today, the challenges and some of the successes that are there, I have with me the co-founder of Readland Global, Dr. Francis Adeshino, joining us via Zoom. Good afternoon, Dr. Francis. Good afternoon, Ma. Thank you for having me. Good to have you on Robbie Minds. Now, we talk about values. Um, I know there's a Yoruba proverb that goes something along the lines of ro remember who um, you're from or the child of who you come from. Remember your background, your family. So when we say that to our children, we're, we're reminding them of the values that the family stands for. So in your opinion, what values should we be instilling in our children? Yeah, um, the backbone of every value is tied to spirituality, the source of uh, morals. So the fundamental values that needs to be installed in every child is that every child should know that they are representing a family because the family is the smallest denominator of a society. So whenever they are outside, they are an ambassador reflecting the ideology or the identity of their family. So the place of value is critical to their character, is critical to their identity, is also critical to their source. So you're very big on spirituality so, and the background of that family. Now, I want us to move to the actual parenting. Um, for a lot of us who grew up, say, in the 80s or even before then, um, there was that sense of strictness and discipline being equal to corporal punishment, being equal to um, being flogged, for example, being spanked. But now we're in an age of gentle parenting. How does a traditional parent um, learn to gentle parent? And is that what parents should be doing, gentle parenting, engaging their children in conversations, as opposed to being strict, like spare the rod, spoil, spoil the child? Yeah, I, I think before we decide to choose which one works, I think the purpose of parenting should first of all be established. Parenting is the deliberate art, A-R-T, and the deliberate act, A-C-T, of building a successful first marriage, then a home. A home is an environment where children are planted like seeds and are expected to thrive. So the how now talks about maybe coming hard or coming gentle, because you can, you can practice either of the two and still fail as a parent. So parenting is the leadership arm of the family that is shouldered with the responsibility to raise children that will become change agents mandated to ensure that the society thrives. You understand? So 
which one works for your child? The ultimate goal is getting that result. So whether you're going strict and hard or you're being gentle, the result is what is important. And in your um, in, in this conversation, you've mentioned raising change agents. Now, in raising change agents, where's the place of technology? We know that from a very young age, children are addicted to their screens. Um, sometimes even the schools um, ensure that they have screen time to do assignments, but at the same time, um, they're exposed to some immoral content that's out there on the internet. So how does a parent manage um, technology in raising this change maker? Like I said, majorly, um, the purpose of parenting is also your ability to create, to set a vision for your child. A vision in a home or a family big enough to accommodate their unique goals, set goals. But as a, as, as a parent, it is your responsibility to lead that journey. Now tying technology to it, you'll agree with me that technology is the language of the future. So navigating through this path to fulfilling those visions or inherent uniqueness, desires or ambition of that child, they have no choice to understand the language of the future. And this language can be platforms or devices. The same way children navigate through the community as it were, so also Technology has created another new space, another new com um, community where they need to navigate through to reach their future. Like you earlier said, the place of value is critical. So when this value system is installed into them as their fundamental mindset, as they navigate using all these devices, they know what is wrong they know what is right. Your ability to guide them through that journey makes the responsibility of parenting for you a must. It's something you cannot, you can't share the responsibility and go and rest. You cannot delegate that responsibility and have a backseat. You need to be on your toes. You need to curate timetables, timelines, on when to use it, how to use it. You understand? Maybe I should stop here. So, <laughs> so the parents the need to take full and active responsibility in raising exactly. their children and raising them to navigate technology by letting them know, letting them know what's right and what's wrong. Now, when we look at um, this internet age, um, we've seen several instances recently of bullying, for example. Um, we've seen yeah. instances of um, sexual assault happening in the schools. Um, what can the parent do to um, teach their children about such situations so they're not in a position to become victims of these um, vices? Yeah, like, like, like I said, I said the family unit or the home is the smallest denominator of a society. It simply means what we see in the society All right, um, is what is going on. Thank you very Amen. much, um, Dr. Francis wow. Adishino. Sadly, we're out <laughs> of time. Thank you. Is the co-founder of Readland Global. Thank you for your contributions on raising children today. It's our pleasure. Thank you. We'll now bring this edition of Robin Minds to an end. My name is Isabella Adedigi. Remember to join the conversation online using the hashtag Robin Minds. Do have a great afternoon. Don't just stand there teasing me. Now it's time.